Chapter Six of the Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter Six The Junto. A new paper started by Keimer. Franklin purchases it. Difficulties in their business. A dissolution of the partnership. Franklin assisted by his friends. David Harry. Matchmaking. Marriage with Miss Reed. In the autumn of the preceding year, Franklin had formed, among his acquaintance, a small club for mutual improvement, which they termed the Junto. They met on Friday evenings. The rules required that each member in his turn should produce one or more questions on any point of politics, morals, or natural philosophy, to be discussed by the company, and once in three months produce and read an essay of his own writing on any subject he pleased. This club answered many good purposes for a great length of time. It introduced better habits of conversation, and drew attention to the most interesting subjects of general inquiry. The members of the club now assisted in bringing business to the young printers. Their industry was unwearied, and soon began to be noticed by their neighbors. This gave them character and credit. George Webb now came to offer them his services as a journeyman. They were not then able to give him employment, but Franklin let him know, as a secret, that he soon intended to begin a newspaper, and would then probably have work for him. He told him his plan and expectations. His hopes of success were founded on this, that the only newspaper at that time printed there, by Bradford, was a miserable affair, badly managed, not entertaining, and yet profitable. Franklin requested Webb not to mention the project, but he told it to Keimer, who immediately issued proposals for publishing one himself. This vexed Franklin, and as he was at that time unable to commence his paper, he wrote several amusing pieces for Bradford under the title of The Busy Body, which were continued by one of his friends for several months. By this means the attention of the public was fixed on that paper, and Keimer's proposals were neglected. He began his paper, however, and carried it on about nine months, with only ninety subscribers. At this time he offered it at a very low price to Franklin, who purchased it, and in a few years made it very profitable. The partnership still continued, though the whole management of the business was confided to Franklin. Meredith knew very little about setting types or working at the press, and was seldom sober. The connection between them was to be regretted, on many accounts, but Meredith had established the business, and it was now necessary to make the best of it. Their first papers made a better appearance than any that had been before printed in the province. The number of subscribers continually increased, and the leading men found it convenient to oblige and encourage the printers. Bradford still printed the votes, and laws, and public documents, but this business soon fell into the hands of Franklin. A difficulty now occurred, which had been little expected. Mr. Meredith's father, who was to have paid for the printing house, was able to advance only one hundred pounds, and one hundred more were due to the merchant, who became impatient and sued them all. They gave bail, but unless the money could have been raised in season, they must have sold their press and types for payment. In this distress, two friends came forward to Franklin, and offered to advance the money, if he would discontinue the partnership with Meredith. Each made the proposition separately, and without the knowledge of the other. These friends were William Coleman and Robert Grace. Franklin told them that he considered himself under obligations to the Merediths, and if they should be able to fulfill their part of the agreement, he could not think of proposing a separation. If they should finally fail in their performance, and the partnership should be dissolved, he would then think himself at liberty to accept the assistance of his friends. Meredith finally proposed dissolution of the partnership. Franklin consented, and the whole business was left in his hands. He then recurred to his friends, and took half of what he wanted from one, and half from the other. The separation was then publicly advertised, the old debts were paid off, and the business went on in the name of Franklin. This was in or about the year 1729. He now obtained several jobs from the government and was employed in printing the paper money. A stationer's shop was soon added to his establishment, and he began to pay off gradually the debt he was under for the printing house. 
in order to secure his character and credit as a tradesman he was not only industrious and frugal in reality but avoided any appearance to the contrary he dressed plainly and was seen at no places of amusement to show that he was not above his business he himself sometimes brought home on a wheelbarrow the paper he purchased at the stores being thus considered an industrious and thriving young man the merchants who imported stationery were desirous of his custom others proposed supplying him with books and he went on prosperously in the meantime keimer's business and credit declined daily and he was at last obliged to sell his printing-house to satisfy his creditors he went to barbados and there lived some years in great poverty an apprentice of keimer's david harry bought his materials and set up in his place in philadelphia his friends were rich and possessed considerable influence, and Franklin was afraid that he would find Harry a powerful rival. He therefore proposed a partnership, which was fortunately rejected. Harry was proud, dressed and lived expensively, and ran in debt. Losing credit and finding nothing to do, he followed Keimer to Barbados, taking his printing materials with him. Here he employed his old master as a journeyman, and was at last obliged to sell his types and return to work in Philadelphia. There now remained in the place no other printer but Bradford. He, however, was rich and easy, and was not anxious about doing much business. His situation as postmaster at that time was supposed to give him some advantages in obtaining news and distributing the papers, and he was, on that account, able to procure a great many more advertisements than Franklin. This was of great service to Bradford, and prevented his rival from gaining upon him so rapidly as he otherwise would have done. Franklin had hitherto boarded with Mr. Godfrey, a glazier, who was very much distinguished for his knowledge of mathematics. The wife of Mr. Godfrey was desirous of making a match for the young printer, and fixed upon the daughter of a neighbor as a suitable person. She contrived in several ways to bring them together, and at length Franklin made proposals of marriage. Franklin appears to have been equally prudent and cautious in this affair, as in everything else. He gave Mrs. Godfrey to understand, and carried to the parents, that he expected one hundred pounds with their daughter. She brought him word that they had no such sum to spare. Franklin sent back in reply that they might mortgage their house. The answer to this, after a few days, was that they did not approve the match that on inquiry of Mr. Bradford they had been informed the printing business was not a profitable one, that Keimer and Harry had failed, and that he would probably soon follow them. The daughter was, accordingly, shut up, and Franklin was forbidden the house. He suspected that this was merely a trick of the parents, to induce him to run away with the young lady, and leave them at liberty to make what terms they pleased. He immediately broke off the connection. The Godfreys were angry, quarreled with him, and he left the house. He had always counted on friendly terms with the family of the young lady to whom he had been engaged before his visit to London. Her unfortunate marriage made her very dejected and miserable. Franklin saw her, and could not help attributing her unhappiness, in a great measure, to his own misconduct. Their mutual affection was revived, but there were now great objections to the union. Her former husband had not been heard of, and was supposed to be dead. All difficulties were finally surmounted, and he married Miss Reed on the 1st of September, 1730. End of chapter 6. Recording by Lee Smalley.